Welcome everyone. This is In Conversations with Chana. I'm Chana Weisberg. Today we have a special guest, Rabbi Nehemia and Razel Schusterman. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Okay, so today we're going to talk a little about parent parenting challenges. Um, do you want to tell us a little about your story, about yourselves? Just introduce yourself to everybody. Sure. Should, should I let off? Yeah. Um, okay, so thanks for having us, first of all. And um, I think today we're going to be talking about um, parenting tips we've picked up over the journeys of our life, which everyone has journeys. I don't know. I don't know if we'll talk so much about the challenges, more about the tips, perhaps. That's what we can all use, right? But we all bit... need the, the solutions more than the challenges. That's for sure. Yeah. And not that, we, not that we got them all, <laughs> but we have some that have worked for us. Maybe it'll help with others, for, for others. Um, that's as we continue to journey on and figure things out as we go. Um, I come from a background of Shluchim. I grew up on Shluchas in Long Beach, California, my whole life. So that is uh, that's pretty much all I know in the in the world of of uh, the business world or the work workplace, if you will. Um, and later we got and, married. And for and those and who questions. have been watching in conversations with Chana, your father was also on this podcast, I believe, correct? With his yes, my father is. With, with his new book, he's now actually world on a world tour. tour. And, all, and that was all the questions tour. that we have about why God, why? Why do bad things happen to good people? Yes. Okay, so you grew up in, in that home. You grew up on Shlichus. I grew, grew up in that home on Shlichus. And, you know, it was pretty much all I ever knew, knew and all I ever wanted to do. I, I kind of felt more comfortable around the secular Chabad house flavored community than even the religious community, just because that was the world that I was in. Obviously, I went to yeshivas throughout the years, but that was the life that I knew and that I wanted to do. And thankfully, I've had the opportunity. And for the last 20 years, we have been in a little uh, suburb north of Boston, Peabody, Massachusetts, where uh, we're actually celebrating 20 years of being on Shlach Wow. Then. Wow. Razel, do you want to tell us a little about yourself, your background? Yes. So I grew up in Morristown, New Jersey. Um, not the traditional shluchas. My father, my parents were sent by the Rebbe to work in the yeshiva in Morristown. And um, so I, it was a small town, but it was a firm community and um, wonderful childhood. And I grew up very close to Crown Heights. So I grew up really, my formative years with the Lubavitcher Rebbe was very much a big part of who I wanted to be and how I wanted to live my life. So shluchas was definitely something I wanted. And I was very excited to embark on a life of shlichas. I don't think I knew what I was getting into. Does anybody, right? <laughs> you kind of understand a little mm -hmm. bit more about it, even though our shlichas was very different from the shlichas that he grew up with, but um, it's something we wanted. And we we truly um, grew as we continued to evolve our shlichas. And um, so that's a little bit about how our lives started. You know, when we, when we dated, we both wanted to go on shlichas and that was something important to us. And we did establish um, this Chabad Center 20 years ago. So that's, it was a really amazing, um, no? amazing. Good okay, so you grew life. up in, in that kind of environment. You went now, you, you kind of followed it in your trajectory on life. You are now on Shluchas. And then what happened? Well, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> a lot of things happened over those 20 years. But I think the part that you want to jump into is, is, People often don't realize that in Shlichus, there's so many components. There's your community and there's paying the bills. And then there's perhaps the most important thing, though often as Shluchim, sometimes I think we might forget that the most important part of our Shlichus mm -hmm. is our children. Not, God forbid, that they get forgotten, but they are definitely partners on the Shlichus. Um, even if they didn't ask to be in the job, but they're in the job. And in, this, in a lot of ways, they play an important role. Sometimes they're significantly helpful just because some kids are wired that way. And, uh, and, and at other times they can be, you know, uh, you know, try to run a Friday night meal with, with, you know, five or six screaming little kids. It can be, you know, a delicate balance. Some, some guests find that cute. Some find that not so cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but ultimately fast, fast forward to do you a think few years before ago. Before you get to that, um, do you think that puts a lot of pressure on children, you know, on the children of Shluchim in terms of having to be the kind of perfect, uh, figures that their parents are trying to represent? 
I think it's the same idea as any from kid where they say, make a kid a Shashem, make a kid a Which Shabbat, means for our viewers, like which, which means just make a sanctification of God's name, make, do something that shows that we're, we're, we're the right thing, that we're doing good with our religion. Impression, you know? in, in, in simple words, don't embarrass us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I think in that case, you have that. There's the pros and cons of growing up in that kind of, mm -hmm. you know, fishbowl. But at the same time, mm -hmm. there's challenges. Right. So I, I think really the answer to your question before you dig into it would be is, our children grow up. <laughs> right. <laughs> you start, you have little children, you have little problems and little challenges. And then as your children grow older, you start to, you know, you start raising teens and there's a lot more that's Oh, wow. Involved. Sure, for sure. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what happened? What happened in terms of raising your children that presented a challenge or a struggle? So I think something in what we, in what we were just saying is an excellent segue into that is that I think in the beginning we would um, have little you know, sit down sessions with the kids. We're going to be having guests. Everyone make sure you're on your best behavior. And so we realized that we're not trying to get the kids to comply so that they impress right. the guests, but the kids really are the most important mm. thing at the table. Do you want to tell and, a story about the Seder that with one of the kids? Oh boy. Um, uh, it's a really good, it's a really good, um, I think. Oh, 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 I'll, I'll say, I'll share it. It's not my story. It's a story right, that right. happened. It's a story that happened with another Chabad Shlich. And, and I don't know if, the, I think it, it is very apropos to the conversation that yeah. we're going to have. Um, there was a Shlich. He's a pretty prominent Shlich, so I won't give any indications of his name or anything. But he, he basically was saying that he was running his Pesach Seder, a community Seder. And, you know, he had his his seat at the Seder and he had this sit, sit child next to him, et cetera. And one of his kids, you know, had his like a, uh, you know, those little little ch children haggadahs that they make where they have all the drawings and the, the glued in pictures and stuff like that and sitting next to his father. And then a really important prominent supporter of the Chabad um, came to the Seder unexpectedly. So he moved his child one mm -hmm. space over so he could give a space for that prominent supporter to sit right next to him. And he said his child slammed his mm -hmm. haggadah closed and went running wow. to the bedroom. And he says... And he said that year I sacrificed the Passover off mm. Paschal lamb, and it was my wow. right. you know, and it was a very heartbreaking thing. But it, but it was such a profound story, and and I think it's something that every and, and really every parent, no matter what what job they're in or what you know position they're in, every parent needs to realize that not to sacrifice their child. Yes. Absolutely, like that would be that would be something that I would say, like that having the Shabbos dinner table. It's very important to me that I make space right next to my husband mm -hmm. for my children to sit so that they know they are as important as Absolutely. my Shabbos guests so that they understand. So those are small little things, but like you have to take into account those experiences that Absolutely. they are having. Right. All mm -hmm. right. So we're jumping around, but but uh, I think it'll all tie together nicely in the end. So, you know, a few years ago, well, three years ago, I would say. Um, the story probably started many years yeah. prior to that, but three years ago, there was an eruption in our home and that was one of our children got involved in drugs and alcohol. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of kids are playing with it. Sometimes it's just uh, teenagers and child's play. And sometimes, unfortunately, it can go further than that and can come into a full-blown um, addiction and it can really impact your life. In some case, it, and in our case, as happens often in some cases, there isn't the right mixture of things or God forbid things are laced with um, other things and our child landed mm -hmm. in the hospital. And so, whereas for a lot of people, they have to live with the perpetual um, ongoing struggle of a child and addiction. In this case, um, that, that could have been our story and that, you know, you know, ultimately Hashem decided how it played out. But because of that immediate um, health crisis, that uh, health and mental health crisis that we landed in, suddenly all of us were forced to confront this, the situation immediately and head on. And, uh, you know, it, it, that led to recovery homes and uh, the, um, uh, sober living, you know, and it became a, a long journey, a journey that continues through today. But thankfully, our child is uh, sober for over two and a half uh, wow, years. And so so we're, we're grateful to that. And really, you know, he, he's doing the work. We, you know, it's a family experience, but, you know, the, the hard work in this respect is his. And um, and so that changed a lot of things in how we parent and how we look at parenting. And and so that's the wow. story of brief. Okay. So yeah. so what was your reaction when you found out that your child was going through these these challenges, was in addiction, was needed to go into recovery? Can you lead us a little through your feelings when you first found out? I mean, that's something for a, when a parent hears these things, I think 
many of us would not know how to react or how to react in a productive kind of way, because I think the reaction that we have could really impact our relationship. So what was your reactions? Um, I think the immediate reaction is absolute shock and you kind of lose your breath and your ability to really think straight. Um, I will say that Nehemia is really, really good mm. under pressure and does well. I think immediately you don't really start to think, how do I feel about this? You just go into survival mode of mm -hmm. what do we need to do? What is the first step? There isn't a guidebook, unfortunately. There isn't a, um, you know, like we have refua hotlines for shlichem who may have a child who's struggling and not healthy and has a heart condition or is, you know, was born with diabetes or special needs. But there wasn't at the time any place for mm -hmm. us to go or someone to reach out to that would even, that we knew to reach out to. So it was really kind that of- must have been a um, very lonely kind of experience, not knowing who to reach out to. Very much so, very much so. And kind of um, had us kind of stumbling mm -hmm. in the dark a little bit, make mistakes as you learn as well. Um, but, you know, we did the best that we could and we had some people that we turned to for advice that Nehemia found some people that really guided us um, now I would have all the contacts and names and I would know exactly who, and that is something that we both field a lot of phone calls from other parents that are dealing with similar situations of where, what, what is the first step? What do they need to do? How, where's, where to from here? Um, but at the time it was, it was definitely like very challenging and, and a, a difficult, lonely, dark time in our lives, but, um, Hashem held our hand and let us. Wow. I think a, a large part in terms of your reaction is the relationship that you have with your child. You know, if, if there is a relationship, I mean, if your child's, I guess your child reached out to you in order to ask for the help. And that I think says a lot about you. What can you tell us about the kind of relationship we should form with our children in order to have that kind of connection? Right. So I, I think there's I, there's a lot in what you just said. Um, and I think really, if if anyone walks away with anything, that sentence that you just said right now is the the golden nugget to take away. And that is mm -hmm. that if you have a help, if you have a I don't want to say, if you have a, a, a good, a strong relationship with your child, then you're setting yourself up for a situation of success. Now that you don't only need to have a good relationship for the times of crisis. It's just sure. good to have it all together. Sure. But in, but, but in a lot of ways, you know, just the, the way, you know, society is shifting, you know, the, the whole notion kids are to be seen and they're not to be heard. Um, the world's different. The world is different today. It's, and, and, you know, I would say that, I don't know that we did it quite as intentionally then. Now it's very intentional. Now we are very intentional about our relationship with our children and recognizing that we have Kanaina are seven children and they are seven very, very different children. They have a lot of similarities, but they're, they each need their own experience and their own relationship with us and their own attention in their own unique can you, way. Can you give us some examples but, of how you do that? Like what, how do you do to cultivate your own relationship with each child or someone out there, some parents sure. out there who might be wondering, you know, what, what should I be doing? What should I be doing right? Again, just to dis disclaim, we're not the experts. <laughs> yeah, but right. we're, we're, only, we're only doing the best that we can in our I, own I, life. I think that the beauty of this is, you know, beauty of, of this story and so many stories is that we can learn from people who are just like us, who are caught in a difficult situation and they've learned things from it. And what can we learn from the things that they've learned? Right. Right. So, so I, th I think prior to this drama in our life, you know, we tried to have mm -hmm. a fun home. You know, didn't always succeed. You know, we sure we yelled and did all the things that that parents struggle to try to keep a balance. But we tried to have a fun home and tried to laugh. And I, you know, even though I might appear serious, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I'm a pretty silly and and, and often very mm -hmm. immature guy. And 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 my kids kind of like that. And I, I like to play ball, so I play ball with them a lot. So for the kids who were into basketball, it was playing basketball. For some kids who like. Um, you know, those online games, which I can't stand and I think they're so damaging, but if that's what I need to do to get at his level, um, you know, that's that for one of my daughters who doesn't like devices, it means like sitting and reading stories with her, which is like sometimes painful. <laughs> <laughs> she has one of these little things and, and I'm reading hours of pink brushes and I hate it. <laughs> And and so you know you connect with each one, and obviously as they get older, it gets a lot more serious because you have to have sure. adult conversations with them and, and talking about real things, life, and and um, so I think for each, I think it's just 
trying to hone in on what your that specific mm-hmm. child is into and try to connect at their level, not have them be what mm-hmm. I want them to be, except that they are what they are and I have to kind of meet them where they're at versus expecting them to step up and meet me where I'm at. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. And in addition to that, I would add that sometimes, you know, it's just really spending time with them individually and as, and as a group also, it's not so much about what you like. A lot of people say, well, Oh, it's so expensive. You have to take your kids out. You have to do this with them. It's really, it, it could be just a silly game mm-hmm. at the table, you know, that one of the little girls, my seven-year-old and six-year-old enjoys, and he'll sit with her for like an hour and play the game and she'll lose and she'll cry. Then he'll, then she'll win and she's mm-hmm. ecstatic, you know, like the back but really just seeing your children and going, doing things that mm-hmm. they enjoy, but seeing them for who they are. Exactly. Like you said, it's just, it's really, I'm not adding, I'm just, mm-hmm. ad, I'm not adding to it. I'm just reiterating right. it, but being, seeing them for who they yeah. are. How, how did this, like, how did this, when your son came out with this, it came to you with this addiction that he was going through, how did it affect your position as Rabbi and Rebetzin? I mean, we spoke before about how we, we sometimes want our children to personify this perfect lifestyle and this must have affected your own how what was your reaction in that way um it's interesting i think a lot of people in general try to you know present a per a perfect picture perfect lifestyle which really if, if you're somebody in a community and you have a leader that you don't really feel comfortable to you know connect with that person because it's so different than from what you're experiencing I don't think we've ever, we're not the, both of us, if you know us, we're very real, honest people, sometimes tough <laughs> faults. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm just very honest, right. you know, about it. And um, in addition, our child that was struggling was open about his story mm-hmm. as well. So he kind of was public about his recovery and his experience. And so it kind of didn't give us a choice, <laughs> but we were also okay because um, we were very proud of the fact that he was, you know, dealing with what he had to deal with and doing the hard work that he had to do, that he has to do. And, um, and interestingly, the reaction was mm-hmm. incredible. The community really resonated, it resonated with them a lot. And people felt like I really can speak to my rabbi because he mm-hmm. knows pain firsthand and, and my rabbit's in, and it really changed things for people. Um, and I, so I think our community was very excited, but I had one woman reach out and say to me, you know, I'm just watching your, how you're helping your, your child and how your child's connected to you. And I just think it's so incredible. And I want to come learn mm-hmm. at your classes, you know, and I was like, what's the connection between coming to a class? But I guess to her, it felt like this is somebody I can, I can accept something from. If this is their way of looking at life, then I want to hear their other, uh, you know, views on, on Judaism and et cetera. So it was very, I think it was very accepted. And I think it only added to what we were doing and made us seem more authentic and real. Yeah, I, I think, you know, to, to the point that Reza just said about that one particular woman, I think there was more, more, more than more, some people actually, in her case, she actually came to our class, other people just started to reach out and engage in whatever way it was. Um, and I think, you know, people have this yeah. image or idea of, of Orthodox Jews, Chabad Jews, um, and, and they say, yeah, that's them and we're us. Yeah. And, you know, it's nice to watch that from a distance, but we can't actually be involved in that because they're so different and then we say oh actually we're mm-hmm. not so different you know they you know th- those statistics you read about in the news e- even they have even they they are they're part of that statistic and i think that that um i guess m- normalizes us in, in a strange kind of way not that we're trying right. to be normal but but it, it, it ends up doing that for them and makes it more available um you know and, and you asked about um you know the impact i think the impact on our community was one thing and, and, and there were other things, I'll, I'll just throw that out, but I wanted to add that it also, the impact right. on the family, but I'll go back in a second. Um, you know, there's other things that as a res- that just kind of evolved as a result of it. Like, for example, um, we've become pretty strong Al-Anon attendees, for those who are not familiar with the world of recovery. That's the, the 12-step program for the families of, of addicts. Um, you know, Al-Anon specifically alcohol. Um, they, they have Naranon for for narcotics, and 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 every every twelve step fellowship. And we found ourselves like going every Wednesday to church, to the basement mm-hmm. of a church to attend the meeting. You know, and, and I would you know quip because uh, I, I also attended a, a a Jewish one online, but it was it was it was it was a Yenta fest, and and I still like I still go to because it's nice to, nice to be with fellow Jews going through similar things. Again, these were things that I did not know existed. Um, some of them didn't exist yet. 
Um, but but you know, after going to to this church setting enough times, you know, this is again after a consultation with rabbis, making sure that we're keep, keeping with halacha. But we said, like, why? Why does it have to be in a church? Why can't we have these things in a in a in a in a shul or at least in a, in a non-church neutral setting? Um, and so we started something, you know, with, with the guidance of certain, um, you know, experts in the field. But this was the brainchild, you know, our brainchild, you know, as a piggyback off an idea from a, a friend in Muncie, of uh, Sonny Perlman, who runs a Jewish recovery home where our child spent a mm-hmm. number of months, Jewish sober. And he had something called Mevakshim Anonymous, which was just an, a, a, a weekly gathering for guys to, you know, get together and be vulnerable, mm-hmm. which is, you know, not things that guys like. And Jewish guys, maybe mm-hmm. less so. I don't know. Um, said, you know, I'm going to pick. I'm going to kind of steal the concept, but adjust it. And we created something called the Jewish Support Anonymous, and it wasn't for a specific crisis. It's just if you're struggling with anything, here is a safe space. It's 12 step based, so we do focus on 12 steps. But you can come, and you know that whatever you say here is going to be safe. No one's talking about anything in this room outside of the room. And if you talk about the rabbi not being on mm-hmm. a pedestal in that room, we're we're mm-hmm. we're just one of the people, and people come. We've been doing it for I don't know a long time. I don't know how many. Yeah, six months. Uh, six months, and it's it's you know re- reasonably well attended. It, it fluctuates, but there's always people there. And so, it, it, first of all, it made it another deep inroad in the community, and it actually brought out people who we've mm. never met before. We've been there for years, and you know suddenly we're connecting with a different segment of, of the community that we never never even a, knew. Existed. A new form of shluchos so, that you so, have, right? Yeah. Right. Right. The, 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 the challenge is that it's anonymous, so you can't you can't really right. meet up or talk right. about anything of course. outside. Of course, <laughs> but it's a lot of ways it's the most holy work of the absolutely work because you're meeting people at sometimes at their most difficult, vulnerable right. moments and, and actually able to together. We're not providing solutions; it's, it's a community setting where everyone's right. helping each well, other. It's interesting because right. you know very often we feel that these secrets or these things that we keep as secrets are going to change people's reaction to us. And it's, you're both verifying. And this is, is relevant in so many different areas where people have this huge secret that they don't want to come out with. And when you can open yourself up to it, you can actually form the greatest connections, which is really what you're, what you're saying. Um, I, I, I want to go on to a little bit about your inspiration. You both grew up in very strong Chabad homes where the Rebbe was a very central figure. How has the Rebbe's teachings and Hasidic teachings in general helped you with your situation? How have you, I guess, leaned on some of the things that you've learned from your past to get you through it? Um, okay, it's a great question. You know, I think for some people, it might be some of the teachings that they hold on to. For me personally, it was more the emotional part of it. Um, I grew up like I said, till my, till the age of 14, very involved in the day-to-day like life of the Rebbe. So we were constantly in the Heights, constantly going for a different Yemen Taivim and, and, and Jewish holidays, Hasidic holidays, all those different special days. And, you know, just being immersed in that love and in that excitement, Mashiach's coming, that, that whole idea that, you know, that the Rebbe was talking about at the time was definitely something that I was, I felt very connected to and um, wanted in my life. You know, fast forward to this time in my life, that was, a, you know, was one of my first personal difficulties, you know, that real challenges. Um, I found myself leaning deeply into my relationship mm-hmm. with Rebbe. When things were difficult, like you said, what was your reaction? If I were to be really honest, I, I immediately sent a, a pawn to the Iowa letter to the Rebbe's grave and um, asked for the Rebbe's help. And, you know, and I would do that sometimes, many times a day during that period of time. And for me personally, it was very uplifting and very comforting for me to know that I was, I was doing the best I could. And I was asking the Rebbe to daven on my behalf and on my child's behalf. And it it really, it really gave me the strength when I needed it. So, you know, I think that having that to fall back on was Hmm. very comforting and very helpful. So we spoke before about the loneliness in such a situation. I guess this was something that helped you not to feel lonely. You felt that the rebel was with you. He was guiding you. He was strengthening you. He was your, your spiritual anchor, your emotional spiritual anchor in such a time. And, and, and truly I did feel that every time I would send a letter and a request, I felt that the ever heard me and my, my question and my request was answered. So yes, absolutely. It, it, it made me feel not alone. Wow. 
Rabbi Nehemia, what do you say? Um, I, I think, first of all, I think that's why it's great to have the uh, husband and wife team. We're, we're one more, um, you know, connects in one way. You know, for, for me, it was definitely a lot more, you know, you know, I can't say I know all of the Rebbe's teachings, but there are certain basic teachings of the Rebbe that anyone who is connected to Chabad knows. And that, you know, for those who grew up in a Chabad family, you're you're literally, you know, nursed on, on these kind of information of the Rebbe's total acceptance, the Rebbe is finding the positive in every situation. And you know it, you're, you know it intellectually, and you even practice it on some level. But somehow when you're forced to, um, you become a part of the story. So it goes from the world of, of nice and theory right. to it, this is actually reality. And this is like, I need this. If I'm actually going to be able to go on in, in, in my life, I'm, I'm going to have to take these, these principles and actually make them a part of who I am and part of my life. You know, there's, there's such a great story. I heard recently um, Rabbi Zients from California who teaches, he started teaching the, um, the, the Shleisha Prakam of Ramam. Um, and he shared a story with his father where his father is, his, his father was a traveling or was a traveling businessman. I think he was in clothing or something and he was ha heading to South America, I think Peru. And the Rebbe, you know, gave guidance that he should give a, a class in, in Torah while he's mm -hmm. there on business. So he arranged in advance to, with some community leaders that they would put together a crowd. And, and when he got there, he, he arrived to go give that class of Torah. And then when he arrived in the room, he saw that the table was filled with every kind of non-kosher food mm -hmm. possible. And like, he was like stuck, like frozen. He didn't know what to do. Like, how can I go give a class of Torah where everyone's going to just be eating non-kosher? So he, he called into the Rebbe's office and he got a hold of Rabbi Chavikov, the Rebbe's secretary. And, you know, it was clear that the Rebbe was either on the line or, or giving immediate guidance. And the Rebbe, you know, the Rebbe told him, he says, to convey to the people that you can't make a bracha on food that's not kosher, but you could make a bracha on water, which is kosher. So ask everyone to take a cup of water and make a bracha mm -hmm. on the water. And that's what he did. And everyone immediately understood that if you can make a bracha on the water only, because it's kosher, then you can't make a bracha on the, any of the other stuff because it's not kosher. And thus the Rebbe very creatively didn't lecture, didn't speech, didn't give any, he, he just simply communicated that these other things are a problem, but by only focusing on what is not a problem. And I think that's, that's you know, that the, there's so many teachings of the, of the Rebbe that highlight this idea. Find the area where you can, where you can connect, find the area where things are working. Um, and the same is with our children. Our children all do things that we're not happy with. We do things that we're not happy with, um, but you know, they're they're always doing something that we can shine a light on and say, okay, this is positive, this is good, and you know, suddenly something that was uh, you know a, a central idea that the Rebbe teaches, Abbas Yisrael, I mean, we all know Abbas Yisrael. There's a, a you know one of the Rebbe's twelve sukkim is about um, Abbas Yisrael, but Abbas Yisrael actually is not only for everybody else; it's actually also for your children. In fact, it probably starts not not probably it does mm -hmm. start with your children, or Another one of the twelve stuck in the you know nature matay masay that 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 um, that we are a, a branch of God's creation and to, to, and and God is glorifying God celebrates it so if Hashem is celebrating this child Hashem doesn't say I'm celebrating this child only if they get nineties on the test only if they are following the trajectory the trajectory we want them. the Rebbe said, the, the Abishra says this is this the, the the branch of my planting that's it why because I created them no, no conditions attached. And it's, while it's difficult for us, we have to find that ability to do the same thing. So you say, you know, how is the Rebbe's teaching impacted? I think this, it just takes all the Rebbe's teachings and makes them very, very practical. Wow. So this unconditional love that you have towards your child, this, this feeling that you just, that you just spoke about that, you know, shining the light on all the good that they're doing. I mean, it, it, we can all say, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. And we should definitely do that. And that sounds good in theory. But when your child is doing something that is so self-destructive to themselves, it kind of makes you react. And some of those reactions are not always so positive. What can you say about that to parents who are facing that? I mean, what if, okay, so we're trying to shine the light on all the good, but what about this huge negative destructive act that the child is doing that could really impact their life in a very permanent way? How do we react to that? I think it's a, it's a really good um, question. I would use the word respond versus react. Mm -hmm. First of all, it really depends on the specific situation and specific scenario and the age of the child. I think that's a very important thing because you know one of the main principles that we've learned in Al-Anon is, is that you can't control 
anyone. You know, there's the three C's of, of Al-Anon. You didn't cause it, you can't control it, and you can't cure it. But what you could do is you can control yourself and how you react to things. So, so it depends. If your child's doing a destructive behavior and they're 20, it's different than if they're doing a destructive behavior at 14. You know, there's different roles that parents play. And unfortunately, there's no role like book that tells you at 12, do this, at 13, do this, now stop this. You know, I, I have a client that I work with in my coaching, and we were talking about how we want to put together a book on parenting adult children because there's not much out there about that we have a lot of ideas of how to parent you know young kids and teens but what about when they're adults like and where does that happen because every child's different so I, I think it's very nuanced and very specific but the main thing is is to ignore behaviors that you can ignore and where you can um, affect change you can you know be a parent and parent and where you have to step back and allow them to mm. fall and allow hurt themselves sometimes, which right. is the hardest thing because you're given a child who is dependent on you and you're supposed to take them from de being dependent to being independent individuals. And that is a lifetime journey. But at times you need to allow them to fall, make poor choices and kind of have those natural consequences happen. Like in our story, that's kind of what mm -hmm. did happen. And so that's, even if those are very self-destructive choices, even if those are de totally detrimental choices, like physically harmful. Yeah, it's so, it's so opposite of what we're trained as parents. Put on a helmet, buckle them up, do feed them healthy food. At some point, they're going to start eating what they're going to eat, make the choices that they want, and you mm -hmm. can't control it. So actually starting younger, the younger you start allowing them to make their own choices and you're modeling good behavior, and that's what you can do. That's it. There's, there, there's very, there, there's very little you can do to stop your child from doing destructive behaviors. You can love them. And there's always, like Nehemia said, there's always something that you could find. You could find the most, the people that are doing the most destructive behavior. They're so kind and they're loving and they'll be so sweet to their little sister. You can find things to build on and to help them because when people are do, doing destructive behavior, it's not just, you're just looking at the, the, the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot going on mm -hmm. underneath it. So if you realize that it's not just a behavior, there's a lot of pain, they're numbing themselves, they are, they are in such deep pain, they don't know that actually this destructive behavior is probably saving mm -hmm. their life right now. You look at it and you're saying all they do is vape and, and, and smoke pot and do all these terrible things, it's horrible. This, this, But what if those things are keeping them alive for right now? It's a hard thing to think about. It's a hard thing to wrap your head around, but many in many scenarios, you really have to step back and allow the, the playbook to just play out. That's interesting. So you're saying like when you shine that light on the good that they're doing, you're awakening their, the strength that's within them, maybe even their soul powers, you're strengthening them. Their own self, their own self love that they, that they're lacking deeply. They know what they're doing mm -hmm. is wrong. There's, it's not like right. they don't know. Right. The, the, right. The, the notion that you need a lecturer to them, um, cause then as a parent, I check it off the lecture box. Um, it, that's the kids know if, if, you know, again, certainly at certain mm -hmm. ages, you know, yeah. it, but, but, but I just want to add to, to what Razel just said a moment ago is first of all, it's not easy. Like don't let anyone, when you watch your child doing something destructive, it, it will tear your heart and, and rip your kishkas, <laughs> right. your, insides, your insides out. Um, and, and it hurts a lot. It, um, no one said this is easy, but but I think I think the notion, you know, and this is another, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in the 12-step program in case people aren't aware. There's a lot of great books written by Orthodox Jewish authors on the 12 steps, you know, highlighting. But the a lot of this whole notion that that why we're having such a hard time handling um, the behaviors of our children is because we feel like we're in control of something. We should have done something. If I only had done this, or if I now do that, then it'll all get better. It's just, we don't really mm -hmm. control anything. We really don't control anything. And one of the, probably one of the more famous slogans is, you know, let go and let God. It, it's really not a cliche. It's really the truth. It's, it's, I mean, it's a very Torah true value is, is I don't control anything. Um, you know, when a kid is, is five, or four and you have to put them to bed. So yes, I do control them. I could pry their fingers off the iPad and say, it's bedtime now. But you know, as they get older, there, there are things that you, you just can't control it. And, and the notion that if, if I, you know, if, I mean, I can freak out, I can have a panic attack internally. I can cry about it. I can yell at them. I can kick them out of the house, but none of those are actually mm -hmm. fixing anything. 
they, they might be making me feel very, very temporarily better about my situation, but it's not fixing the situation. So, you know, even from a very rational perspective to recognize that I'm not controlling anything and, and freaking out and flipping out despite my pain is not fixing anything. So it's ill-advised. It's not, it's not, it's not solving anything. And you're, you, but what is solving something is loving them, letting them know that this is a safe place. You can always come back home. If you need, if you need help, we're going to be here to help you. Um, and, and, and that doesn't mean that they get to run roughshod over the house and destroy the house and flip everything over. You can have boundaries, but, but boundaries also are not for them. The boundaries are for, for me. Boundaries are so that my life doesn't spiral into chaos alongside mm-hmm. their life. Um, I'm not putting boundaries on them. I'm putting the boundaries for, for me. Again, that's another um, recovery principle. And these are, these are you know, incredibly important ideas. So to your, your question was, you know, it, it's easy to preach it. How do you do it? The answer mm-hmm. is it's not easy. It's not easy to do it. Um, and it's not even, it's not fun to preach it either, but it's, it's, you know, you, when you tried everything else and nothing works, you, you're forced to just look at, okay, mm-hmm. what is working? What's, what's going to be effective? What's going to actually accomplish anything? And, uh, when you, when I, I believe we've tried all the wrong routes mm-hmm. until we started trying some of the more mm-hmm. right routes, True. um, after you've tried all the wrong paths and, and they didn't lead you anywhere, you might as you, you start to have no choice, but to go in a better way. Well, I, I guess this falls back on Razel's way. Like I get, when you feel like you need to do something, so Razel just dobbins or she goes to the aisle or she writes to the rabbi or she somehow falls on her spiritual reservoirs. And that is doing something in a spiritual sense. Yeah. yeah or, 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 or each other. other, you know, we're, we're very blessed to have a very strong um, connection with each other. And we really uplifted each other through the process. We leaned on each other right. a lot. Wow. Um, so, so you need to have you need to have that support, and you also we had other family members that were very supportive to us as well. Again, because we were open, there were no mm-hmm. secrets, and we shared with our family and our friends, and our friends and family stood there and held us and helped us in a difficult time. So, I think again, a lot of the it, the at least your approach to it. But but back to what you're saying is like when you have younger children, I think see this is the part you don't go to the opposite extreme. You're not permissive. You're not like just do whatever you want because kids want boundaries. They want somebody to tell them what's right and wrong. Um, you know, you know, my 12 year old or 14 year old want to have a, um, a different game in their Xbox. And I'm like, well, this is where we're at. And this is, we're not doing that. And, um, and I, I don't just say, because I said, so I say, it's just not good for you. You're getting very into it. It's taking over your, you're thinking about when you're sleeping, it's too much for you. You, you, you can't do this. It's not good for you. And I'm, and I'm parenting you because I, I love you and I care about you. So it's not author, authoritative. It's rather being a parent that is helping your child see where you're coming and where you're trying to help them. So there's boundaries and there's you're involved, but there's also the idea of natural mm-hmm. consequences. And you can start when they're mm-hmm. little too. Give them that, you know, that, that ability to control the things in their own life. Because if you're busy controlling your children every move and telling them what they should do and what they shouldn't do, when they actually become older, they don't know how to make their own decisions. So you need to start this at a younger age as well to help them able to to make their own decisions. Right. I I think, I think something that we've seen with our kids, you know, again, not all the time, we're not perfect. We get it wrong a lot. Uh, Maybe maybe as often as we we get it right right, or more, but but very often when we'll, you know, put a certain, I don't don't like, you know, telling a child that they can't have this level of a, of a game or whatever. I don't don't know if if that's a boundary or if that's just a parenting moment, Um, but they're definitely Mm -hmm. upset at us. Right. Um, And then after, you know, sometimes an hour, sometimes a day, thank you. You know, I understand like they know, kids know, they, they know, they want you Mm to run, you know, steer Mm -hmm. the ship you know, but a lot of parents and us included at times, you get caught up in the tantrum of the moments. You know what, if I just do that, it'll solve this, this tantrum will shut down immediately and give in, but you really hmm. haven't helped them. Right. And I think that's a really good point that you're saying there, because um, I think that's a really important thing for parents to think about. So if your child is coming back, once they've calmed down and saying, thank you, you're right. I see that it's hard for me. I really want it, but I, I get it. That's a sign that there's a connection, that the relationship is mm-hmm. working. If this child is constantly belligerent and constantly angry with you, and is this is they're not coming back, and there's not that you know, like kids could tell you one minute, "I hate you, mommy," and the next morning, "Mommy," mm-hmm. there's big hugs. That's proper mm-hmm. attachment. And and when that's not happening, and when you're having constant that, that's a sign that there's something wrong with the connection, and it's time to re. Um, take a look again at the relationship and say, maybe in this child, in this case, 
I shouldn't be holding such a hard ground. I have to make some exceptions that I usually wouldn't make for another mm -hmm. child, but there's this relationship that needs fixing. So we got to go back and really kind of look at it closely. That's a, that's a real sign of, of how to parent that specific child. I'm going to add that, you know, I remember very prominent Chabad speaker, mm -hmm. so I won't say his name, but I, I'm sure you've interviewed him or you're going to interview him. Um, he, he's old enough to be my father, but I remember him saying one time, never say I'm sorry to your mm -hmm. child. And Ooh, that might have been yeah. true once, but I assure you that's not true today. And it, it's, it's, it's a humbling moment where parents say, you know what, we, we got that one wrong. I need to go say, sorry, sorry, sweetie. You know, I, I took a strong stand on that. I thought about it again. And, you know, I realized maybe, maybe that's not. Well, I, I, I think then you're modeling to your child how to say they're, they're sorry or how to say that they did something wrong. Yes. Right. Exactly. So I hear that often from one of my children constantly, that the fact that you'll come back and tell me that you thought about it and you think that you overreacted or you said something that you didn't really think was important or it's one of the most important things in the relationship because it's again it's the idea of sure. repair there's a rupture and then there's repair and that's what cements the relationship even to a deeper extent and, and becomes a more stronger connection between the parent and the child same is true for any relationship mm -hmm. between you and your spouse all of these ideas that we're talking about by the way are the same concepts in mm -hmm. relationship as well focus on the good look for things that are working talk about those things um, hone in on those things that are that are working and 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 there's there's room for rupture in relationships and then there's the repair afterwards. As long as there's that reflection and coming back and coming back to the to the relationship, it right. makes it stronger. Right. Nehemia, you were speaking a lot about you know the love that the Rebbe taught us to love every child, to love every person, and how that helped you. Is there something about a child's inner core being so perfect and so good? Every person's inner core being so good, the neshama of a person that has helped you both in your journey with your child. When you see a child doing something so destructive for themselves and for others around them, but you see beyond it to their neshama, to their inner core, to their soul. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I think I maybe uh, mentioned something about this a little bit before, you know, that, that uh, um, um, verse, and I can't remember offhand where, where one of those 12 sukkim is origins. I don't know if it's Mish, Mishle or, or where it's, um, um, uh, Proverbs or Ecclesiastes, where, wherever the origin is, but that 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 a child is 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 the branch of God's planting, um, is is something that that goes through my head a lot. You know, again, there's there's fear, which is often a major driver of the mm -hmm. mistakes we make. Uh, there is there is um, anger, sadness, frustration, annoyance. So so uh, very often those are the first things that, that uh, come up for, I'll just say for me. And, and the key is to hang tight, you know, process it, let, get through that and then show for the kid with, with the fact that they are a piece right. of Hashem. You know, it's that, that well-known story. I'm sure you, you, you know it um, with a prominent uh, Chabad rabbi who um, um, he, he smacked his child. He would give his children, Patch as they did it. Said Ooh, in the you're, good old days. You're, you're making it sound like all these Chabad prominent rabbis are doing such destructive things. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they're not. They weren't prominent. Yeah. Were prominent Their story okay. no, but it's, it's the end of the story that makes it very beautiful. And is in a private audience with the rabbi, he mentioned mm -hmm. it to the rabbi, and the rabbi said, "You know, if your neighbor's child came over, would you hit him?" And he said, "Of course not." And so the rabbi said, "Well, remember that that this child is." Also, Hashem's child, so he's not only yours. And just like you wouldn't hit your neighbor's kid, you know. So, you know, I'm not talking mm -hmm. about hitting, but it's 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 about making that mental right. shift. And, and again, not easy, not easy. Um, but I think the more you do it, um, you know, the, the the quicker it is to get there. I don't know if it, I, don't, I don't know if it's better you get at it. I think it's always a journey. Anytime you see your child doing something stupid, irresponsible, dangerous, it's never. You never become comfortable mm -hmm. watching that mm -hmm. ever. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, but but the quicker you can go through all those steps in your head, okay, anger, wrong mm -hmm. response, fear, wrong response. I'll go through all those quick steps. You know, you go through those steps faster and get to okay. But they're a good kid mm -hmm. and they're hurting. If they're the fact of the matter is is you know Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Russell. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of him. Prominent trauma um, psychologist in the, in the Orthodox community. He 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 said a great line which really resonated with me deeply. He said he says. There's no bad kids. 
He says, no kid is doing this to be bad. They're hurting. Something's bothering them. And if you're lucky, you get you can get to the root of that quickly. If you're not, you know, I think the 12 step program is excellent in the sense that it really, you know, fleshes out from from someone who's working the program where where their um, challenges are at, you know, where where their patterns are off and what may have happened to them that hurt them. Um, but sometimes you can go a lifetime and never get to the root of what's hurting them. But if you know that they're hurting, then you recognize that they're reacting mm -hmm. to their pain. They're not trying to be difficult. I, I think the Rebbe saw that in so many things. He saw that in teenagers. You know, he said they're not rebelling. They're looking for something more genuine. You know, he saw it in the 60s. Yes. He said they're not just, you know, against everything. They're looking for something deeper, for something more sincere. You know, people are just seeking. And the way that they seek, they might not know where to direct their their wishes, but they're they're seeking something greater. Yeah. The Rebbe modeled this absolutely. You saw it. You would just stand in dollars in line and see all the different types of people came, the patients and the kindness and the Rebbe, the way the Rebbe, the Rebbe right. looked at them with such love and such deep right. respect. Absolutely. He, 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 and I'll, I'll take what you're both saying a step further. I mean, there are a number of stories of people who were truly mm -hmm. mentally ill, who ended up either in an audience with the Rebbe or, or, at, or at dollars with the Rebbe, and the Rebbe just found such compassion mm -hmm. and love for these people who, you know, the, who, who it's very difficult to find where where the 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 contribution that they're bringing to this conversation or the you know and the Rebbe managed to say they are in a shama and the Rebbe gave them such mm -hmm. love you know there was a, a very unusual story of a person who was who only spoke French and the Rebbe spoke French and he somehow ended up in a private yechidus with the Rebbe and this person was clearly mentally unstable. And Rabbi Groner was so concerned, Rabbi, the Rebbe, another one of the Rebbe's secretaries was so concerned about this guy having private audience with the Rebbe that he quickly ran and called one of the yeshiva students who spoke French to kind of stand by the door to monitor what's going on, to if there needs to be a, right. an intervention or interruption. And the person basically told the Rebbe something to the effect that he said, um, I, if, I'm paraphrasing because I don't know if I have all the details perfect, but he said something, he says, you know, I'm, I'm the Mashiach. Mm -hmm. He tells the Rebbe. So the Rebbe says, interesting. Do you put on tefillin? So he says, not all the time. He says, well, if you're Mashiach, you definitely need to be putting on tefillin all the time. Because Mashiach certainly wears tefillin all the time. Do you observe shops? And the Rebbe did this with a, a, a bunch of different things. Again, the Rebbe found a way to find something positive, to turn it into a positive wow. experience. So To motivate. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. So I definitely, to answer your question, definitely, I think that that's a piece of mm -hmm. how we were raised, modeled by the Rebbe in the teachings. And then when you keep that in mind, when you're parenting, and if you tend to any of, if you listen to any of the lectures by Rabbi Shays Taub or Y.Y. Jacobson, you hear that idea, you keep that at the forefront of your mind. It does help, but there's a step, there's a process to right. getting to that. For them. sure. What about your other children? How did it affect them? It's a great question. I think it, like Nehemiah mentioned earlier, um, addiction of any form, and I think also I would, I would say mental illness is a family disease. It's not just the person we all play a part and we all are connected. It's not like, you know, this, this, is this, you know, person is the problem in the family and this child, you know, uh, I'll just, I'm going to throw in one word. We're all impacted. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're all impacted by it and it does impact the siblings as well. But like, if, again, if we have the belief that Hashem chose this child to be our child, Hashem, it, there's a, a story told of, I don't know exactly where it's quoted, but, I heard from Rabbi Shimon Russell as well, that before a, a neshama comes into the body, the parent is asked, do you want to be the parent of this child? And the child is asked, do you want to be the parent, the, the child of this parent? And so there's knowing all the details of what, what it's going to entail. And each, the parent and the child mm -hmm. say yes. So we choose it. That's one part. That's how you know you're the right parent for this child and they're the right child for you, even if it doesn't feel that way. But as siblings, if we believe in the idea of Ashkacha Pratis, divine providence, Hashem meant for this child to be the sibling mm -hmm. of this child so that they learn something from the experience. They become more sensitive and kinder to other people that struggle. They have an understanding of a topic that they may not have ever heard. My children understand the, now my, my six-year-old knows the word addiction and alcohol and, and disease. These are not words that um, I was familiar with until I was right. in my forties. Sure. <laughs> so, but, but we believe that there's a purpose here. Hashem, chose this to be our story somehow and for them to be their sibling and and that's a message that we try to relate to them when they 
when they display frustration around this and say, well, why do you know now people look at me different or this is different or this impacted me some way? I say, I know. And you, first of you'll validate that is challenging and that's hard. And I can hear you allow them to share that struggle and at the same time, also give the message of Hashem knows that and Hashem wanted something from all mm -hmm. of us. So this, we're all, we're all players. We're all part of the story. Wow, as well. I think that's so powerful and so impactful. You're taking something that could be a detriment and you're turning it into such a positive thing and you're taking an awareness and, 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 and showing the child how this is something that could be positive for them too. But not, not, not course, without tears course. and crying and pain. But again, this is something that I've learned in my short 44 mm -hmm. years of my life, that growth happens in the discomfort. This is the line my children, where, where does growth happen, everyone? In the wow. discomfort. Of course, seed, that's where a flower comes from. It goes, it's a seed that decomposes completely in a dark, wet space. And it completely becomes a, a different form than it was prior. And then it buds into a beautiful flower. So we have to go through discomfort. And if, we, if you're uncomfortable, that means you're growing. If you're feeling comfortable. Absolutely. So I, yeah, go ahead. One thing, you know, we often say jokingly, but it's not such a joke to all the other children is like, you know, you're lucky because, because of that story, we are nicer, <laughs> better, kinder. I don't know. About <laughs> I don't know. Or permissive, but we definitely are much more, open more aware to right? being, being, being okay with, with, with mm -hmm. things and decisions and school choices than we might've been previously. So it, it really has changed us. And, and that way you guys, your life is, is improved because before we were pretty, you know, this is this rigid square that we live in and now the square is a lot more right. squiggly. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you something. Why, you know, a lot of people who have, who go through such struggles, um, would just keep it to themselves, but you have both decided to go public and to be on this interview. And just, I know you're on many, many interviews. You're, you, you just go public about your struggle so that other people could learn from it. Can you elaborate like why this is something that you chose to do? I, I don't think we chose it. <laughs> yeah. it chose you, I guess. <laughs> But, but even the places where we talk about it publicly, you know, whether it's here or Kesher Nafshi, you know, it, it, in fairness, it was asked. In other words, we're not no. seeking to go and, and, and speech and preach. But the fact is, is as Rezo mentioned earlier, our son chose to be very public about it and we chose to not to not mm -hmm. hide it. Um, and the fact is, is, is like, like we tell our children, if this landed on our lap, then there's something we're mm -hmm. supposed to do with it. It's not supposed to be here mm -hmm. for no purpose. So, so the fact is, is you know, Razel more than me, but we get calls so often from people in struggle, and we are able Absolutely. to help them. You know, at different people at different levels, and and if if that's at least one of the positives, then that's, that's beautiful. Important. Absolutely, yeah. I I I I really don't don't like secrets. Mm -hmm. Never have. Um, I think secrets are just right. really bad for people. You know, we teach our children. There shouldn't, there shouldn't be any secrets because secrets really can lead to not good things. Um, I mean, secrets don't have an end. Like you can keep a secret that your mother is having, you're making a surprise birthday party for your father, but right. there's an end to it. Like as long as right. there's a beginning yeah, and end privacy to the versus privacy versus yeah, um, secrets. But um, the, the point is, is that I think that people really want to hear more. I know for me personally, if there would have been a podcast that I would have heard somebody talking about their journey with their child talking about these topics and I just had heard it how how much of an impact it would have had on me at the time and I was absolutely went. so so if I can do that for other people I feel that that's 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 our that we, we, we need to it's our obligation like Nehemia said this happened for a reason and we need to um, be able to share our experience and don't don't misunderstand it to mean that we have all the answers because we made our own mistakes along the path and the journey and I think it's really, you have to be really careful when people are coming to you for advice to not just transfer your experience to theirs because every story is different and every human and child is a different experience. But um, overall, that's, you know, it's, it can be really impactful. That's beautiful. Others. That's really beautiful. Okay. Final question. Uh, so your child, your son or your child is right now on his way or in recovery. He's stable. He's on a good path. It's kind of 
I mean, the story's not over, but it's still kind of a happy ending, happy ending, a happily ever after kind of ending. What about people that aren't going through that happily ever after? What can you say to them? What are your final words, I guess, that you would want to say to other people who are going through the situation right now and who um, are not dealing with that light at the end of the tunnel, but are in the darkness of the tunnel? What would you advise them? Good question. It's a yeah. It's it's an excellent question, and there's no easy answer to that question. Can you reframe it before you answer it? Sure. Because there's happily no ever after, right? No. After. I, 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 was, I don't I'm think really I don't think there's happily ever answer. after in life in general. There's always challenges, but I'm just saying, like you know, he's on the right. Life's on the right path right now. Path, but you, right. Here, that that path is something that's easily right. and the you know like I don't want to sound you know. Everyone in the beginning, when this was going on, people didn't hesitate to share the statistics with us, which every time they said it was like literally a gut punch. Do you know that the statistics <laughs> of people relapsing is 80%, like only 20%? I'm like, okay, I got that. I got, thank you for reminding me. But that was humble as well to realize that mm -hmm. this is a journey. It's well, that's why we say we are great. in recovery, right? We're not, we're not ever recovered. Right. There's a different right. opinions on it. Some people call themselves alcoholic versus an right. alcoholic, but yes, there's different but yeah, go ahead. Um, again, I don't, I don't know that I can add much wisdom to this to say, first of all, it's an ongoing journey. You know, in, in the recovery room, they say, you know, your, your experience, uh, what is it? Your experience, strength and hope. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they is, is you got to keep on working on yourself and keep going back for more support. Um, back, going back to what we said before, you can't always control your child mm -hmm. and you, de well, not you, you can't always never. control your child, and you can never control your child, and you can never control the outcome. You can only control how you react to it all. So, therefore, you know whether it's going to Al-Anon meetings or going to your spiritual mentor or uh, davening, davening to Hashem, whatever, whatever it gives you strength and support is something that's really important. But also, I think there's a, a, a fundamental shift, like in our house, like you know the motto, and I, I'm sure we picked it up from somewhere. I don't know. We didn't make it up. I don't know where it comes from. But you know, is 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 we say happy healthy from you know you gotta you have to readjust the priorities you know a lot of parents like if my kid is just following the line and doing the things so i don't care if they're not so happy and i don't care if they're so mm -hmm. healthy you know emotionally or whatnot. and we flip it we want you emotionally help, healthy physically but emotionally healthy um and we want you happy because if you're unhappy your yiddish guy is going to be a very mm -hmm. miserable yiddish guy so not you know it, I don't want to say it's not much of Yiddishkeit because we, we follow Taira and Halacha even when we're not in the mood, but but certainly for a struggling child um, to reframe it, focus on helping them get happy and healthy and, and the from either will or won't follow, but it's not the priority. It it, 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 it has to, again, under the guidance of Rabbanim, you can't do this on your own. You have to do this. You, right, have, Rabbanim. you have to have, fair, absolutely correct. You have to have Rabbanim who are experienced in these uh, areas and, and they're not, they're not as, as, as many of them as need to be, but they're getting there, and to, with proper guidance to to re reframe how you look at things. And when you reframe how you look at things, it, it does get a little. Well, I, I guess that's a strong foundation. You know, the foundation is healthy, it's firm, it's emotionally stable. Then you could build on it all the other things that you want. But if the foundation isn't strong with happy and healthy, then the rest could fall right. through. I don't think a lot of people realize that because we believe that living a firm lifestyle will give mm -hmm. you a healthy and happy lifestyle. We are connected, is, but it's right. not necessarily in that order. I mean, if there's something blocking the health, the health, the mental health, the what's going on underneath, that's impacting it until they can, then they can be right. firm and healthy. I mean, that's but like you said, it's firm. kind of part of it. Like if you're doing, if you're doing, if you're following Torah in the way that you should be following it, a person should be healthy and happy yes. because that that's right, exactly. right. that's kind of, I, I would add to that because to answer your question first of all if there's somebody who's listening and is in the throes of uh, dealing with a trauma of some form a drama with a loved one i think it's the most important message is something that we heard from our one of our mentors in this topic which is sonny perlman and the idea of it's not there's nothing that's an emergency it's just life-changing idea for us so there's no such thing as an emergency. Yeah, if there's yeah, an emergency, yeah. you have to call 911 because you're having a heart attack or you need to, you know, need to call somebody to, but this idea prior to this experience for me, I would say that I was somebody who was easily, um, 
I mean, I don't want to say dramatic, but like, oh my God, what's going to happen? What are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this? And as you go through challenges, you realize, wait, there's no such thing as an emergency. Feel really difficult and challenging and hard, but it's not an emergency and you're going to get through this. And there's going to be an, an, another, there's going to be a light at the end of this tunnel and there's going to be a better day to come coming ahead. And when you're feeling overwhelmed, you have to like kind of calm yourself down to realize, okay, this is not an emergency. This is difficult. This is challenging. But we, what do we do? How do we navigate? What do we, what are our next steps? And if there are next steps to help this loved one, you follow those steps. If there isn't any steps because you've tried everything and you're at the point where you have to allow this person to live their life, you have to follow through with that. And it's difficult and it's challenging. But once you are able to kind of do that and get through those motions, you'll realize that there is no such thing as an emergency. And if there is an emergency, you call 911. It's very, it's very impactful when you're able to really wrap your head around that. It's not an emergency. It, it, it's a very deep idea that Rezo is saying over and, and, and it, 60 seconds doesn't do, yeah. it ju- doesn't do it justice. But, but, I, but I think the, maybe the nugget is um, when you're coming from a place of fear, things right. become emergencies instantly. And, and, and you're also um, reactive, you know, which is goes back to your point before about not being so reactive, but realizing that to take it, take it, take a deep breath. You can get a phone call from the school telling you some horrible news about your child and you can freak out or you can say, okay, this is an emergency. What do I want to do about it? How do I want to react calmly, wait, process, allow things to happen and then respond versus react. Mm -hmm. And things become manageable. They're not like difficult uh, scenarios that are impossible to, to deal with, but uh, rather they feel like things that you can actually manage. I I remember, you know, you know, kind of, we have seven children, um, you know, with the, with the older ones, like they came home from school and they didn't do their homework or they needed to do their homework or the teacher said they weren't following along in class. And I remember being like, Oh no, no, no privileges, nothing until we get that done. And, and, and then you're, you're like, as you get older, you're like, okay, and so what? Okay, so I'm not going to be a Talmudic scholar. Right. That's okay. They, they, they will do something with their life. But it, it, the, the, we, we start off, well, I guess that's the nature. Parents start off young right. and inexperienced. Right. So this doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be with crisis parenting, just general parenting. And you learn, okay, it's not an emergency. Slow it down, breathe. And even the serious things are also, you learn to, it's incredible how much you learn that you can live with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my grandmother used to say that we should never be tested by by Hashem because what we can handle, but but it's true. And and every and, it, and if you really are connected to your faith, if you really believe that Hashem is running the world, it helps you to move from from fear to amuna to place of betachan. I think the most important takeaway of all the things actually is to remember to not compare your child to other children, your child to who you were and how you grew up and what your expectations of this child meet your child where they're at. And realize that it's a journey. what you're looking at right now is not necessarily what you're going to be looking at in a year, in two years, in five years. That's beautiful. So just and the faith that down. things are going to get better, that God is going to make it better. I think that's a great a great takeaway. Thank you both so much for joining us, Rabbi Rabbi Nehemia and Razel Schusterman. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with all of us. Thank thank you for sharing your experience with all of us, and your tips and and and, and perspective. On, I'm sure it will be very helpful to many other parents. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. You're welcome.